Hello and welcome to today's video. My name's Alan and I'm the one that does the videos here. Today's video is about somebody called Paulina Kneisler. She was a nurse working in the T4 murder operation in Nazi Germany. And in the winter of 1941-42, she went off the Eastern Front and she later admitted to murdering German soldiers there who had been wounded beforehand after being evacuated to the area of Minsk. This video was originally uploaded in October 2023. It was flagged as being unsuitable for YouTube and after a supposed manual review it was accepted. I always do that to give them a chance to decide if they want to accept the video or not. It uh, went live and when, uh, within about 24 hours it had, had almost 8,000 views, which for me is quite a lot. However, then YouTube decided it was going to censor the video, it was going to demonetize it. And obviously I must have some uh, access to funds, it's the funds which actually help me to be able to produce the videos, the, vi the money I get from YouTube doesn't even cover the costs, but when they demonetize something that takes me more than a week to do, then I have a zero policy towards YouTube, I took the video down. Uh, now, uh, there was however part of the video that where a uh, using a Soviet uh, propaganda film from 1942, which is in the background. It's called The Battle for Moscow. And uh, there is a scene in this where there's some firing at a, a German plane. And there's a crashed German plane. And it's something which could be purported to be the body of the pilot is outside the plane. So what I've done is I've stuck a photograph over what could be the body. Now, according to YouTube's own community guidelines, you're not allowed to show bodies or uh, so, uh, whereas it wasn't particularly clear that it was a body, I have stuck something over it and hopefully YouTube will allow this now to go through. Unfortunately, this is just part of the many problems I'm having with YouTube at the moment. But if you're interested in that, let's uh, put it up after the video. Thanks for watching. I hope you find this interesting. Ein Schneebad ist eine gute Abhärtung. Weiße Tarnhemden für den Kampf im Schnee. Ausrüstungen für Posten und Beobachter. Russia in the winter of 1941 to 1942. All fun and games in the snow if one were to believe this newsreel shown in cinemas at the end of December 1941. Not so in reality. The German army managed to reach only a few kilometers short of Moscow, but suddenly it had to face the wrath of a Red Army counter-offensive. German troops were cut off, without medical facilities, unable to use their vehicles which did not have engines which could work in such low temperatures, unable sometimes to use their weapons which froze, unable to find shelter, unable to find medical care. Hitler's mad dreams of empire building in the east with racist fantasies of populating these territories with the master race were freezing in the depths of an ice hell. As supply services collapsed due to the unavailability of transport, wounded soldiers lay dying, not only on the battlefields, but also in collection centres to the rear. What help 
could be given to the wounded and dying. Perhaps there was one solution for which the Nazis had already found a tried and tested method. This is Grafenek, today in Baden-Württemberg in southwest Germany. In the early part of World War II, hundreds of Germans with psychiatric or other illnesses were brought here to be killed in an operation referred to as T4. Within a short time, a number of such killing centres were opened to dispose of what the Nazis considered to be life, not worthy of life. On the 1st of February 1940, an Austrian doctor, Imfried Ebel, became the medical director of another killing facility at Brandenburg. In autumn of 1941, he assumed the same position at Bernberg Euthanasia Centre. In the summer of 1942, he was at Treblinka, gassing tens of thousands of people per week. However, for some reason, prior to Treblinka, he was sent to Minsk in January 1942 to assist with attending to the medical needs of the Wehrmacht and evacuating those that needed to be moved. We know nothing of what he did there. However, one nurse... Paulina Kneisler, who had also been involved in the T4 killings, did admit after the war that she had gone to Minsk in order to administer fatal injections to wounded German soldiers. Was Ebele also there to murder wounded German soldiers? We don't know, as Ebele never stood in the witness stand. He committed suicide in his cell before he could be brought to trial. I would be the first to admit that the evidence that wounded German soldiers were murdered by the regime is largely circumstantial. However, I do think it's worth looking at. In this presentation, I shall look at the life of Paulina Kneisler and her career in Nazi crime. Kudyumivka lies around 10 kilometers to the south of Bakhmut in Ukraine. On the 10th of March 1900, when Paulina Kneisla came into the world, it was part of the Russian Empire. Her father was a wealthy landowner, and so presumably she grew up in an environment of privilege. However, their world was shattered with the Bolshevik Revolution, and when the communists seized Odessa, her father decided that it was time to go. Her father went to Germany where he acquired a small estate near Detmold in Westphalia. Times, however, were very tough for agriculture in Germany in the 1920s. Whereas the huge estates to the east of the Oder River could expect government handouts, those smaller farms in western Germany went bankrupt. The family lost the farm and thus their entire wealth during the economic crisis. Her father on being a wealthy landowner, ended up as a railway worker. When the family came to Germany after the First World War, Paulina Kneisler got a job as a seamstress. In 1922, she trained as a nurse in Duisburg. In 1923, she moved to Berlin where she worked in a private home. And in 1925, she got a job in the Berlin Book Children's Sanatorium, which provided accommodation for its staff and Kneisler moved in. Paulina Kneisler had grown up in a world of privilege which had been lost through no fault of her own family. She may well have resented her new position in life, having to do a job that a few years earlier someone else would have done for her. She may have resented the communists who had taken her privileges away from her, resented the communists in Germany above all, and resented the Versailles Treaty although she had been a national of one of those countries that had gone to war against Imperial Germany in 1914. 
This made her fertile ground for National Socialist propaganda with its exploitation of resentment and its hatred towards the Bolsheviks. Hitler came to power in January 1933 and she may well have felt some kind of relief when the communist and social democrats were subject to mass arrest. In 1934 she joined the German Christian Church who had this flag. There can be no doubt about which way their leanings were when you look at the way the flag is. This was a splinter group within the Evangelical Church organization, aligned to National Socialism and its racist dogmas, and which was particularly anti-Semitic. She was also a bloc leader, someone who kept an eye on what other people were up to in nearby households, or in her case, given the accommodation where she was living, in other rooms. As a bloc leader, she would have had to swear an oath of loyalty to Adolf Hitler. Nonetheless, she didn't join the Nazi party until 1937. This is the former Grafnet killing facility near Gromandingen in the Reutlingen district of Baden-Württemberg. In 1940, at least 10,654 people with disabilities were systematically killed here as part of the medical homicide during the Nazi era known as Action T4. Grafenick Castle was built around 1560 as a hunting lodge by the Dukes of Württemberg and expanded into a Baroque castle in the year 1762 to 1772. In 1929, the Samaritan Foundation bought the castle, set up a home for the disabled, and in 1930, set up its own cemetery. At the beginning of World War II, Hitler decided to kill people who were physically and mentally challenged, the excuse being that they were a burden to a wartime economy. This was directed from a central office in Berlin's Tiergartenstrasse 4, and as such became known as Action T4. In the planning phase of Action T4, the Württemberg Ministry of the Interior and Stuttgart, which worked closely with the Berlin T4 Central Office, proposed Grafenegg as a suitable location for killing people. Thus, Grafenegg became the first location in Germany for industrialised mass murder. The location was appropriate as the chateau grounds are excluded in the forest, as you can see in this video, and as there are only two roads up. Therefore, it was relatively easy to hide. The castle today is very much similar to what it was then. The chateau had sufficient space for the administrative staff and for the staff who were going to do the killing. The killing was done in an outbuilding some 400 metres or so from where it was kept out of the way of those in the administration. On the 13th of October 1939, Richard Albert, who was the district administrator of the Munzingen district, ordered the evacuation of Grafenegg Chateau. This was to take place on the following day. On the 14th of October 1939, it was officially confiscated for the purposes of the Reich. At the time of the requisition, there were around 100 patients and around 12 staff at Grafenegg. Four days earlier, the nunnery at Reuter, near Bad Walse, had been informed by the Württemberg Ministry of the Interior that they were to receive these people. Four buses took these people away. As far as I'm aware, all the patients who were transferred out of Grafenegg on the 14th of October 1939 survived Action T4. Over the next few months, Grafenegg was converted into a murder facility. The interior of the chateau was converted to administration and living rooms and a police office was set up. A wooden barrack with around 100 beds was constructed. An outbuilding was converted into a gas chamber and a crematorium built. 
In addition, staff from Stuttgart and Berlin were recruited, which would have included doctors and nurses, police and security, administrators, domestics and, of course, corpse burners. By the beginning of 1940, there were almost 100 people working there. One of those people was Paulina Knisler. Killings began on the 18th of January 1940. Means of death was via bottled carbon monoxide, which came from Eige Farben Industry at the Ludwigshafen site, which is today BASF. The first victims came from the care home at Elfling Haar in southern Bavaria. Eventually, victims came from 48 institutions for the disabled and mentally ill, 40 of which were in today's Baden-Württemberg, six from Bavaria and one each from Hesse and North Rhine-Westphalia. They are, of course, modern administrative boundaries. The T4 organisers, Victor Brack and Karl Brandt, ordered that the sick should only be killed by the medical staff. Since Hitler's letter of authorisation dated the 1st of September 1939, only referred to doctors. The operation of the gas tap in the killing facilities was thus the job of a doctor. However, sometimes no doctor was available, so another member of staff operated the gas. All Grafnik doctors used only fake names as camouflage in correspondence with the outside world. The last killing was on the 13th of December 1940. Grafenek closed because the authorities failed to keep the murder secret and there were increasing protests. After the closure, the personnel were transferred to Hadamar, where the killings continued until August 1941. Her work at Grafenek and Hadamar was later classified by the court as being that of an assistant since there was no evidence that she carried out killings at the time. And, as she was not a doctor, she would not have been expected to do so. According to her own statements, she'd picked up and accompanied the people intended for killing from other institutions to Grafenegg and in 1941 to Hadamar. She helped them undress, took them to the doctor's room, assisted during examination and finally took them to the antechamber of the gas chamber where they were killed by others. The euphemistically caring sounding term, help with undressing, appears in a different light when we consider the statements of the nuns who were originally responsible for the care of patients at the Ietse Monastery. At the beginning of the T4 campaign, the sisters believed that the patients could be safely transferred to another nursing home. When, after the second women's transport in November 1940, they saw how their laundry and clothes were torn and thrown upside down on a heap, they concluded that they had been violently torn from the victims' bodies and that the people were no longer alive in all probability. The T4 programme slowed to a crawl after August 1941. However, it did not stop, and killings continued until even after the liberation of Germany. Most of the staff of the T4 killings were now free to do other things. Some ended up in the death camps in Poland. However, Paulina Kneisler was sent on a secret mission in occupied Minsk. Kneisler was assigned to the TOTE organization, although this was clearly camouflage for what she was really doing. The operation was called Osteinsatz, the Eastern Action. Supposedly it was about the rescue of wounded German soldiers in ice and snow. Paulina Kneisler revealed after the war to an acquaintance that she had helped to kill wounded German soldiers with injections. The soldiers were said to be mentally ill. Apparently, she was allowed to devote herself to a speciality, which was the destruction of life unworthy of life. However, unlike at Grafenach and Hadamar, here she had actually done the killing. The victims this time were German soldiers who, after doing their duty for Fatherland and Führer, were badly injured and traumatized by the fighting. The only help that the National Socialist regime had for them with no short-term prospect of a full recovery was a deadly injection. Many of the troops would have had post-traumatic stress disorder and the fact that Sister Paulina said that she killed the mentally ill indicates that the focus was on mental invalids 
Soldiers who reacted to the horrors of war with tremors, paralysis, deafness or mutinous. As I stated earlier, there is not much evidence except for what she said, that the regime murdered those that were wounded fighting its war. It could of course be that the aim was to kill Soviet prisoners of war, but given that hundreds of thousands of Soviet POWs were left to die of starvation in huge enclosures, the decision to kill some of them by the comparatively inefficient process of injections seems somewhat unlikely. The presence of the likes of Eberle and Kneisler, who had no experience in evacuating the wounded, but did know how to mass kill people, is highly suspicious. For her service to the regime on the 22nd of December 1942, she received the Medal for German People's Care, and on the 20th of June 1943, she got the Ostmedal, the Eastern Medal. Once whatever was happening behind the Eastern Front was completed, Kneisler worked in the Weilmunster State Sanatorium and Nursing Home and the Bemberg Killing Centre. In August 1942, she was sent back to Hadamar, occasionally moving to other locations where the sick were murdered. These locations include the Eichberg Asylum, Eberswalde and at the Kalfbeuren Irtse Institution. Valentin Fadelhauser was in charge of Kalfbeuren Irtse. He was a psychiatrist born on the 28th of November 1876. Thus, he was 67 years old when he requested staff with experience in killing from the T4 headquarters in Berlin to carry out the murder operations he was running. The killing methods he developed himself included malnutrition. His idea was to deny the patients fats which would cause death in around three months. He was bothered by the working of the nuns who were responsible here who occasionally undermined his dietary instructions and gave bread to the starving sick. At his request for a reliable and experienced euthanasia nurse, the central office of T4 dispatch Paulina Kneisler who arrived on the 15th of April 1944. Waltelhauser set up a special department for her in Irtse and the death rate immediately jumped to the desired level. The death rate, in fact, only dropped temporarily when Paulina Kneisler was absent due to holidays or for other reasons. It was Sister Paulina who decided which of the sick people would die unexpectedly in the night or the following day. Paulina Kneisler was arrested shortly after the end of the war in June 1945 at her new place of work, the Hochenschwangau Hospital. On the 28th of January 1948, the District Court in Frankfurt am Main sentenced her to four years in prison for aiding and abetting murder in the National Socialist killing centres at Hadamar and Grafenegg, as well as Kalfbeuren, and finally from April 1944 in Irtse. The jury justified the low sentence with the fact that what counts in the first place is not the deeds themselves, but the criminal will. Because Kneisler subordinated her own will to the criminal will of others, she was only to be condemned as an assistant. On the 20th of October 1948, the Higher Regional Court in Frankfurt convicted her of murder and aiding and abetting, saying, that the activity of the accused was no longer mere assistance, but an act of perpetration. From September 1942 to May 1943 in Hadamar, and from April 1944 to early 1945 in Irtse, Kneisler also gave the sick deadly pills and injections on the doctor's orders. In all of these cases, the accused themselves should have been convicted of murder instead of being an accessory, as explained above. The fact that they are not doctors but nursing staff does not justify any difference. However, the Code of Criminal Procedure does not permit higher penalties than the prison sentences imposed by the criminal division and the jury. Sister Paulina who by her own admission had hosed off, to use her words, thousands of disabled people for five years in Grafnik, Hadama and, and Kaufbeulen Irtse, still felt unjustly persecuted and commented on the verdict, My life was one of devotion and self-sacrifice. I was never hard on people. 
for that I have to suffer and suffer today. The court, of course, knew nothing of the murder of the wounded soldiers. Paulina Knaisler served one year of her four-year sentence. She died on the 26th of January 1989 in Berlin Steglitz. In this video I've stated all the evidence that I know of about German soldiers who were wounded being murdered by the regime. It needs to be made very clear that this happened somewhere near Minsk which was well behind the front lines. There's a difference between a quick mercy death for a badly wounded soldier who otherwise would die slowly in a situation where he cannot be evacuated and those who have already been evacuated but the regime did not wish to assist. Now if any other evidence turns up in the future I'll update this video or do an entirely new one. Such evidence could indeed be uh, circumstantial. It's interesting to see where the staff of the T4 murder operation went. Most of them did go to places like uh, initially Lublin then to Belzec, Sobibor, Treblinka. So if we can actually find out where others went as well then this might help us know more about the subject. For the moment, thanks very much for listening. I upload every Friday at 20 hundred hours and sometimes I upload on other days as well. So if you're interested in this type of thing, uh, my specialization is World War II and in that the Holocaust, then you uh, might want to subscribe and the best way to know when I'm uploading is in fact to subscribe. I also do other things such as uh, live chats where I talk about a historical theme, maybe it's on an anniversary or maybe there's no special reason. And in that case, you can actually um, communicate not only with me, but with other viewers at the same time as well. But for the moment, all the best from me in Germany. I hope that you found this video interesting and uh, maybe I can actually give a few more details about it. So YouTube's uh, community guidelines are unfortunately not known to the staff at YouTube. Uh, I uh, will supply in the description a link to them for those who are interested. It does say very clearly what you can put up and what you can't put up and it also says unclearly in some cases what can't go up and so this is very much up to whoever actually looks at it. Unfortunately the staff at YouTube do not know the community guidelines. I've actually spoken to them a couple of times over the chat and they are unaware of what they are and I think this is quite common. The problem is this is when people like myself spend an ages doing videos then you want to know that you're at least going to get some contribution towards the costs of actually making them. The money I earn from YouTube is not very much. It will allow me to fill up my vehicle with fuel from time to time uh, but that's just about it. Uh, mind you it does tend to burn a lot as it's a motorhome. The problem with YouTube is uh, not only these community guidelines but also another uh, little trick which is what I call the false copyright uh, scam where there are companies uh, such as SF um, Film Studios in Sweden or British Pathé who will claim that a film belongs to them because you've used the same source material. That is not the source material that came from them but the same source going back. So you may have taken a photograph in an archive and they've done the same thing, they will claim that it's theirs. Or you may have used a historic film which is now in the public domain, they claim that it's theirs. And this false copyright scam uh, is now beginning to cause me a great deal of problems. Now as far as SF Film Studios are concerned, I've spoken to, I've sent a message I should say, uh, an email to the managing director and I've spoken to their copyright team, but they've done nothing about it so far anyway, so I don't know uh, what will happen there. As far as things like this are concerned, I just have to be more careful to ensure that nothing uh, resembling dead bodies is actually in my videos. I do appreciate that the sort of material that I'm dealing with uh, is dealing with the uh, Nazi regime, the communist regime, uh, more recently even the war in Ukraine and the Putin regime, then uh, there do tend to be some pretty gory things inside. Unfortunately that's the way it is. I do appreciate that YouTube doesn't want to have this 
uh, on uh, monetized videos so therefore it's up to me to make sure that they won't appear but anyway I've done other videos explaining it, what uh, what's happened and from now on I am going to actually put up an introduction like this every time I'm forced to take a video down because of YouTube messing me around.